Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. My name is Brooklyn. I'm the pastor here with my husband, Coy. We just want to say thank you for coming to Somos Church. We have had a really great time the last three weeks sitting and having coffee with so many of you. Part of our value is story. We love to hear people's stories, and if we're not learning your story, then I don't, under, I don't think we're really being the church. So there's a card in front of every single one of you. Whether you've been coming here a lot or not, we'd love to meet you for coffee and find out who are you, what's your story. This week, I think we met with maybe six or seven people, maybe 20 collectively, I don't know. The last few weeks, it's been a lot. But there's been one word, when I ask, how do you feel when you come to Somos? What, what, what is it about Somos that makes you want to be church with us? And they, hands down, answer with one word. And you, do you want to guess? What word would you think of? It starts with an H. Home. Yeah. And it's nobody's telling each other that this is the word, but I wanted to share this verse with you before we watch this video because I feel like it's a verse that's coming true in our community. It's out of the book of Zephaniah. It's from a very broken place that this prophet shares these words with God's people. It says, at that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among the people again, and I will restore your value. Oh, isn't that good? Before your very eyes, says the Lord, I will restore the value. And these are the words that I have spoken. These are good words, and they're meant for us. And I just want to show you a little bit more about what God's doing here in this place that we call home. Aren't you glad to call this place home? This is home for us. This is who you've been for the, for the years that we've existed as a church. It was so fun for Bruno to put that video together and, and for me to look back. Uh, Brooklyn and I, we watched it a, a few weeks ago with, uh, with a meal that we were having and she just had tears running down her eyes as she was remembering. And some of you have tears in your eyes now remembering some of those steps that we took. And so I'm blessed to be serving you as, as a pastor. And you know when we first started, I, I didn't even want that title, pastor. I said, just call me a Jedi because somebody made that up for me. Uh, but, but I'm honored to be a part of a leader of, of a church like this. And so I am grateful, uh, grateful to have a video like that to show where we have been. And so tonight, I want to talk to you about where we can be going. If you're new tonight, I'm glad that you're with us. You know, this time every year, we take a moment to speak to the heart and the soul of our church as part of a weekend, what we call Give to Grow. Because we believe that every year, every single year, there's more that God wants to do through every single local church. And so what we do at this time every year is we challenge our people to give to help us grow into the mission and the vision that God has for us in the future. I started it off last week with a message. It's a three-week little series that I put together. And what I talked about last week is, is, is raising the foundations for future generations. And so today what I want to talk to you about is repairing and restoring. That's what I want to talk to you about today is repairing and restoring. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is in the Old Testament. It's maybe three quarters of the way through the Old Testament. That's in the first half of the book. Isaiah is, is what we refer to as one of the prophets. One of the prophets. You know, In seminary, I remember my professor explaining to us and I was in shock in my brain because I'd never heard this before. He said, you know, when you hear the word prophet in, in reference to the, the writers, the prophets, they're not fortune tellers. <laughs> they're not foretellers of the future. That's not who they are in the Old Testament. They're not people who are telling you about things that you have to decode and, and try to figure out what is happening here and, and how am I going to figure this out. Uh, uh, people who are the prophets made it very clear what's going to happen. But it was all based on the past. And what they tried to do is give you a picture of yourself in the past to help you understand why you've gotten yourself into the trouble you're in in the present. So they could show you the path that you could take to get to a better future. That's what the prophets did in the Old Testament. They warned God's people, stop doing what you've already done. Listen to God's words and do something different. And the prophets are, are the ones who have spoken to God's people at the point at which they've already messed up. They decided to be disobedient to God, and now they've found themselves in situations they don't want to be in. And that's where the people are who have been receiving this word from Isaiah. 
uh, they found themselves removed from their homeland and, and they had become uh, a people who are refugees in, in a foreign land. So I'm going to read to you verses 9 through 12. I'm going to start with the first half of the second half of verse 9. It says, If you remove the yoke from among you. Important word is if, if you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger. Now, before I go any further, I think that phrase right there is something that the church should remind itself that was written in the Bible that God says, if you remove the yoke, and then he declares that the yoke, one of the things is the pointing of the finger. Can you believe that thousands of years ago when these words were written, that God already knew that the church would struggle with pointing the finger? Like that's where we're at today in a lot of cases in our churches in America is we've gotten ourselves in a place where people are tired of the church pointing the finger. They'd rather have the church reach out a hand. But we got into the place where we point a finger. And this long ago, God already knew that we'd have trouble pointing our finger. I think that's amazing that God knew that long ago that we'd struggle with it. But you'd think by now we would learn. So it says, if you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness. Have you ever sat in the dark and wished for a light to come on? (laughs) And And Isaiah is saying, that's who you get to be. You get to be the light that shines in the darkness. You're not the one waiting for the light. You're the one who's bringing the light. The exciting part is you get to be the one that people have been waiting for. They've been waiting for you in the dark, and you get to be the light, it says, if you remove the yoke. It says, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom, the bad stuff that you're sitting in, will be like the noonday. (laughs) The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in a parched place. There's a lot of us in this room who are in a parched place. My grandpa was in the hospital. Uh, Some of you heard me talk about it last week. I I flew up to Ohio on Friday morning and flew home on Friday night because they gave me the call on Thursday saying he's probably not going to make it. Your grandpa is probably not going to make it another day. I, I spoke to my dad, and my dad saying, cool, I don't see how. Like, I just don't see how. He, he has gotten to the point where he's so bad. He, he was life flighted from my hometown all the way to Columbus, Ohio. He was losing blood. He lost consciousness. They put him on oxygen. Like, they did not think he was going to make it. And so my grandma said, I, I want you to come up. And so I flew up there. I flew up to where he was. And, and, and just before I got there, it was the first time that he had opened his eyes That's scary in the hospital when you see somebody you love open their eyes, but because they have so much medication in their body, it's like they don't see you. It's like they're looking through you. And so my family had seen him open his eyes just before they got there, and I went into the hospital room, and and he opened his eyes for me. And I couldn't tell if he saw me or not. But guess what? He got better. (laughs) He got better, and he kept opening his eyes more and longer, and eventually took that air tube out. And then a few days later, they say, we think he's going to progress to the point where he's going to be okay. And then they got to the point where they said, there's one more big thing that you need to jump through this hoop. And they said, you have to learn how to swallow again. <laughs> I didn't know that people that had tubes in their throat would forget how to swallow, but he couldn't swallow. And the reason why it's so important is because he hadn't had food for two weeks. You go without food for two weeks. He wanted water so bad, he said. He just wanted a drink of water, but he couldn't because he couldn't swallow it. But he wanted a drink of water. He was parched. And some of you in your life, you need a drink from the living water. You are parched. And you're saying, God, flow down the river from the mountaintop. I need something in my life. I feel parched. And Jesus says that I'm that living water. But in Isaiah, God says through the prophet that... uh, God will satisfy our needs in those parched places and make our bones strong. It says, you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. And that doesn't mean a whole lot to us 
because the places where we live are still standing, but they left their homeland and the homes have been torn down and their place of worship is gone. And God is saying, your place that was once ruined shall be rebuilt and you will get to be the one who does it. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And this is what I want to talk about tonight. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. You know, this church is filled with people who want to repair and restore. I know it because I've been a part of it from the beginning. This church is filled with people who want to repair and restore. You want to repair the breach in the church. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a breach in the church. There's a hole in the church, and people are passing through it, and they're not coming back in. There's a hole in the church, and I believe you are the kind of people who want to patch up that hole and start bringing people in rather than letting people flood out. And I also believe you're the kind of people who want to restore hope in our community. But the problem that I've seen, the problem that I see that's in front of us is an enormous challenge. And the enormous challenge is this, is that we as humans, we struggle with being self-serving and tight-fisted. We struggle with it as humans. That's what we struggle with. We struggle with being self-serving and tight-fisted. And if we're not careful, this is what happens. We grow comfortable wanting what we want. (laughs) And then giving very little to get it. And then we complain about what we don't have. If we're not careful, what happens to us in the church is that we become a closed group who focuses on looking inward rather than an open group who reaches outward. That's what happens to us if we're not careful. And so my junior year in college, one of my religion professors, he gave us a visual for this problem. So I'm going to give you the same visual that he gave to me. He went to the whiteboard and he drew a huge circle on the whiteboard. And he said, I I want to do an exercise with all of you today. All of you have grown up in churches because you want to be pastors. And so you've been around church long enough to at least get you to accept a call. So you're familiar with churches. Here's what I want you to do, class. All religion majors, all guys and girls who want to be pastors. He said, I want you you to fill in this circle with things that the churches that you have belonged to do that serve in the church. So if you look at the chart, I think that we got, correct? The the other one, the the arrow's pointing in. So if if you look at the circle, the circle represents all of us, the church, and the arrows represents the direction that we are focused. So if you look at this circle, we are focused inward. It says, so list me all the things as a church that you know that you do as ministries that are focused inward. This doesn't mean they're bad. It just means we're going to list these things. And so kids would raise, students raise their hand. Okay, Sunday school. Thank goodness we don't have Sunday school anymore. <laughs> Sunday school. Okay, we, we wrote that down. Uh, next thing. Worship service. Somebody else raised their hand. Youth ministry. Okay, that fits. If somebody else raised their hand. Revival services. Remember revival services. Young people don't even know what that means. I mean, people running on top of pews and everything else. They, old women waving their hanky and, and people screaming at the top of their lungs and people getting blessed and all this craziness happening in the room and people coming up and we praying for them and getting them saved and every single night they get saved. It doesn't matter. We'll save them every single night. And, and that's what we did. Revival services. And then we think about some of the other things that we're doing and somebody raised their hand to potluck dinners. Who loves potluck dinners at church? As a pastor, I do not like potluck dinners, but we're going to do one at Christmas this year. So get ready for it. We got potluck dinners, and then we got the famous Christmas cantata. Now, I don't know if it's cantata or cantata. I don't know what it is, but it's Christmas cantata. And then we also have, we don't get enough at Christmas, so we do an Easter cantata. And and, and so somebody raised their hand, and we put that in there. And I I think we may have one more thing. Uh, I know, I think that's it. The class that day, that's what we came up with. And the professor said, okay, now we're going to reverse it. And we want to point the arrows out. And I want you to start naming things that this church is, that you've been a part of, do that are outward focused. And so we all looked around. Are we going to get graded on this? (laughs) And somebody raised their hand. How about upward basketball? Upward basketball. 
Some of you don't know what that is. It's a basketball league that a church runs. We raised upward basketball, somebody said. And the professor said, I don't know, that's a tough one. Because we do it at the church. And we do it at the church so that we can get people to come to our church. So I think we'll take that one and we'll move that inward focused. <laughs> so somebody else raised their hand and, and they said, uh, well, how about the food pantry? That's got to be outward focused. And the professor said, Whew, okay, well, let me think about this one. The problem is they have to come to your church to get the food. So maybe we'll take that one and we'll move that one on the inward focused. <laughs> Is anybody else got anything? And so somebody raised their hand and they said, door to door evangelism. Remember those days? You all are glad. I don't make you do that anymore. You know you all are glad. Door to door evangelism. Can't argue with that one. That one is outward focused. And so somebody raised their hand again. I got one. I got a good one. How about missions? That fits. And then that was it. So let me show you the comparison of the lists. Keep going. Inward focus, outward focus. And that was the class for the entire day. And he looked at us and he said, this is a problem. <laughs> because if the church is going to exist in the future, it has to be outward focused. All the things that we do that are inward aren't bad, but if that's all we do, and if that takes precedence over being outward focused, he says, this is a problem. And I think this is the problem that Isaiah 58 is trying to address to the people. It's in a different context, but it's the same problem. Because the people that Isaiah is speaking to in Isaiah chapter 58, they have become inward focused. They have been focused on themselves. Now, Isaiah 58, it's written for people who want to repair their ruined buildings. Their buildings have been ruined, and they want to repair them, and they want to restore their broken community. That's what they want for themselves, because they are refugees who are dreaming of going home to raise up what has been torn down, because they've lost all those things. That's what they want. And in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 9 through 12, God promises to give them what they need to make this happen, but it's based on two conditions. And the two conditions is that God's people must remove, they must remove heavy economic and social burdens on the people around them, and they must be willing to share their resources. In verse 9, it says, to remove the yoke around you, to remove the yoke around you. They have placed heavy economic and other type burdens on the people who are their brothers and sisters and their slaves and their servants and, and their neighbors. They placed them on them and they've let them carry these burdens and they had not done anything to remove them. It says to remove the yoke. Now, if you're not sure what a yoke looks like, I have provided a modern version. Did I? There it is. <laughs> Carry that around with you all day long. That's the visual that the book of Isaiah gives to us for the people who are existing in connection to and in proximity to God's people. And God's people are just letting everybody carry those things around. I don't mean physically, literally. I mean they are placing burdens on people and they're forcing them to carry them around. Burdens that you can't carry every single day by yourself. Isaiah 58 says this. It says, if you are genuinely for your neighbor, meaning if you release them from their oppressive burdens, then, it says in verse 12, if you do those things, then you shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to live in. Can you imagine being a church who repair, repairs the breach 
Like, I don't know if any of you read any of the articles that exist out in the world today, but they are telling us, and I don't think we need the articles to tell us, that people are leaving the church. Like, the church is in decline. We're not in a state in America where we are on the upswing as a church. We are in a recession as a church in our nation today. We are not growing our investment. We are losing our investment because our investment is in people. And people are not continuing to come and receive faith in Jesus and finding freedom from their lives of sin and brokenness and and pain. They are just going from the church and living lives that are completely separate from what God wants for them. And not, not, not because they're necessarily sinful. It's because there's a breach in the church. There's a hole in the wall. And Isaiah says, you get to be someone who fills that in so that nobody else floods out of it. Once the hole has been fixed and then we can start focusing on bringing people in, they're not going to find themselves falling out of that place into somewhere where it's dark and lonely and away from the one who can save them. And then can you imagine this? Can you imagine be, being someone who, re, who, who restores the streets to live in? I, I like to think that, 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 that to do this means that we get to clean up the debris and we get to remove all the hazards and, and we get to repave the road so that people feel safe enough to run and play without judgment or fear. That's what I imagine it means to restore the streets. For them, it means to go back to where they once lived and make it a place where they can live. For us, it's, it, it, it's something that we get to do. It's kind of not, 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 not like literal. It's something we get to do for people to feel safe to live. And as I look around our society, I see a lot of places who are crying out for their streets to be cleaned up. <laughs> I, I go to schools a lot. I go to a middle school, and, and every time I approach the middle school, as a one personality on the Enneagram, it just drives me crazy because there's trash everywhere. If you know me as a pastor here, I hate trash in our parking lot, and I hate when the bushes aren't trimmed right, and I hate when there's weeds in the parking lot, and I hate when this slime thing grows on the, on the back of the building, and the reason why is because Disney World has ruined me. Disney World is the place that you go to and you can't find trash on the ground. It's amazing. I don't know how they do it, but I've always thought if Disney World will do it, the church should do it. Like we should have enough respect for the, for the places that we go to and the things that we own that we don't just, well, there's trash on the ground. And so I go to schools and I see trash on the ground and I think, what is happening? Why can't somebody pick up the trash? Why do middle schoolers think because they're at school, they can just throw their trash on the ground? I, I don't get it. And then I I start to meet some of the parents, and I understand. (laughs) There was one day after school, I was at a middle school in town, and I was coming home, and as I got to the parking lot, I saw a a grown adult man get out of his car and do something strange. I saw him pick something up. And, And as I was looking closer at what he was picking up, he was picking up broken glass from his driver's side window. I found out the story later. He, he had gotten into a fight with a family member on the campus of the school. Like, what in the world? <laughs> Got into a fight. How are we going to expect the kids to not fight when the families get in a fight on the school property? So he does something I couldn't imagine myself ever doing. He picks up the broken glass from his window, and he walks over to the grass on the school property, and he throws it in the grass, and he gets in his car, and he drives off. And I think to myself, A school like that deserves to have people who will show up and clean up their streets and remove all those hazards and make their place, their home, their school, a place where kids can run and play without feeling judgment or fear. (laughs) You like that one, Patty. Good job. But I'm telling you, God wants to give Somos Church the energy and the fortitude and the resources to repair and restore. I believe that. God wants to give us those things. If, if we will notice our neighbor and live genuinely for others. Because renovation in the church begins with a commitment to restoration in our community. <laughs> renovation in the church 
the thing that we hope for. We would love to, wouldn't you love to see these seats filled? Wouldn't you love to have four more services? Wouldn't you love to have friends who are begging to come and sit in a service and hear about Jesus so their lives can be changed? Wouldn't you love for family members to think, you know what, my life needs something more, and they think of this church or another church, or they think of Jesus, and they're trying to get into a place? Like, we would love to see renovation happen in the church. But trust me, folks, as it tells us in the book of Isaiah, renovation here starts with doing restoration out there. Because that's why we exist. We don't exist for the healthy. We're here for the sick. That's what Jesus said, not me. Jesus came for those who need him, not for those who don't. And we are those who follow Jesus and live with his power. And so God is saying, if you want renovation here, you've got to make restoration possible out there. The question is how. And based on what we're reading here, there's two things. It's by removing burdens and sharing resources. So let me tell you some things that we have been able to do because some of you have shared resources over the last few years, specifically the last year. You as a church have given thousands of meals, thousands of meals to middle school students who are homeless. You have given thousands of meals. You have stocked a supply of school clothes for an elementary school so that no kid has to go home because they had an accident at school. You hosted an Easter service on the campus of an elementary school so that the neighborhood didn't have to come here. They could go right where they are and have an Easter service. You provided (laughs) skateboard decks and volleyball uniforms and basketball jerseys for a middle school. You hosted a breakfast for teachers and administrators at a middle school and then at, at an elementary school. And then you gave all the teachers their favorite book. You sent more than 20 students and student leaders to a camp in Georgia to learn how to do missions and to grow in leadership. And this month, you don't know it yet, this month you are going to provide a Thanksgiving meal for an entire middle school staff. And so I think about all these good things that we're doing, and then I think, what more can we do? (laughs) What more can we do? And then I hear God whisper, You can sponsor more kids who are homeless. And I hear God whisper, you can start mentoring at the elementary school and the middle school because they've been asking you for two years. And I hear God whispering, you can coach more teams for the middle schools and purchase more uniforms. I hear God whispering, you can show more appreciation for teachers And you can buy more books for their libraries. And you can provide new computers for their classrooms. I hear God saying, you want to know what more you can do? There's a whole lot more you can do. Because we serve a God who always wants to do more. And the challenge for us, this is the hard part. The challenge for us is to give more. God wants to do more. And the challenge for us is to give more. Now, we can give what we gave yesterday, and I'm not going to judge you, (laughs) but it will not get us to where God wants to take us tomorrow. We can be the kind of church that says, I'm going to be self-serving and tight-fisted. I'm not going to judge you. We don't have to do any more to remove some burdens and, and share more resources, but trust me on this, the days of our church will be limited, and they will be cut short. But if we fight against an inward focus, if we fight against an inward focus by practicing being for others, then God will empower us to repair the breach and restore the streets so that both the church and the world will be filled with people who are celebrating their newfound freedom in Jesus. So what we want you to do is we want to challenge you to give. We should have some cards in the room that we can hand out to you. I'm going to have Jim. I'm going to have Joey bring those. They're just going to pass those out to all of you because we want to give you a chance to give tonight or to make a pledge tonight.
So there's two things I'm really challenging you to do. I'm challenging you to give for the very first time and make a commitment to give consistently throughout the year, or I'm asking you to consider giving above and beyond what you've already given. So on these cards, you will see a couple of different options. You will see an option where it's a one-time gift, and you get to tell us when you're going to give it. We just want to know so we can plan and we can celebrate what God wants to do. Or you could start giving for the very first time, and that is something maybe you'll do recurring, where you'll say, I, I believe God's calling me to give $10 a week, maybe $50 a week. Maybe some of you could do $1,000 a week. I don't know. Maybe we got some billionaires in the room that we're not aware of. But God is saying, here's your chance. Here's your chance to share your resources so we can remove more burdens and repair that breach and restore those streets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you stand with us as we, as we go into our, our final moment together here. And I'm going to ask you just to hold that in your hand, if you will. Uh, you can take a look at it while I'm praying. You don't have to listen to my words. But I just want you tonight to ask God, what more can we do? What more can we do? What burdens can we remove? The yoke that people are carrying and how can I be a part of it by sharing some of my resources to make it possible? And if you feel God leading you tonight, we'd love for you to take that card and fill it out and drop it in the offering as you go. And then we can celebrate together what God wants to do through all of our people. If you do turn one in tonight, if you look on the back walls, we just have a little bag for you. You can grab a bag off the wall and take it home with you. It is nothing special. It's just for you to take home and remember that we are living for others, not for ourselves. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for the ways that you have given to us. We are grateful for the sun that, that left heaven to come to earth. We don't think about the treasures that were, that were left behind. But we don't think about the security that was, that was released. And you came here to this earth and you walked as one of us. Often among the lowest of the classes. But God, you never looked at us and saw us as people who were different. You saw us as people who need to be released from some kind of prison. Or you saw us as people whose eyes were blind and we needed to receive sight. Or you saw us as people who were sick and needed a touch of healing. And God, you reached out your hand through your son, Jesus, and you touched those who were untouchable and you risked, being, you risked being labeled as somebody who was as sick as the person that you touched. You didn't care because you were removing burdens. You weren't hiding behind your resources. So God, help us be people who are brave enough to say, God, there's a part of us that's real. There's a part of us that includes our resources. And God, we don't like to talk about it, but we know as humans we struggle we struggle being self-serving and tight-fisted. And if we're going to serve you, if we're going to serve you, the ultimate challenge is to give up everything and walk in the dust that your feet kick up and follow you to those places where you provide for 5,000 people who don't have food. And we're worried about feeding our own mouth. So God, give us faith, give us trust. Heal our hearts if we're feeling burdened by this. God, if we're feeling judgmental because, because we're challenging people to give, God, re remove all the negativity and let us be people who are free to push your vision forward. In your name we pray. I'm reminded, I'm reminded of a story in the Gospels when this, this rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what can I do to inherit he wants God's riches. What can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, sell everything you have and give it to those in need. I'm not asking you to do that tonight. I'm not even saying that passage is asking you to do that tonight. But what I think that shows us is this. Jesus was seeing how far he was willing to follow him. That, that's what he was, how far... You want my riches. You want eternal life. You're asking me how to inherit it. I think Jesus would say, how far will you follow me? So that 
it's not a prescription. Like giving, giving is not a prescription for the sick. It's a description of those who have been healed. Do you see the difference? It's not a prescription for those who are sick. God doesn't go to people who are sick and say, give some money to the church now, come on. Take your pockets, get your, get your wallet. God doesn't want to ask people who are sick, who aren't followers of Jesus, but if you're a follower of Jesus, he says, that's who you will be. Somebody who is generous toward the bride of Christ, which is the church. The church is God's plan to build God's kingdom here. So when we give, it's not something I'm prescribing you need to do to get into heaven. It's something that describes who you are when you're following Jesus because you want to build the kingdom of God right here on earth. So if God spoke to you tonight, I hope that you'll fill out your card and you'll drop in the offering as you go and say, God wants me to share some resources with what's happening through this local church. Will you say thank you to God for all the things that God has given us? Will you clap your hands just a moment and say thanks to God for everything that we've had? All right. Well, thank you for being here and letting me run a little bit late. I'm sure the kids' ministry is ready to strangle me right now. So as we leave, we... we we combine our resources with God's missions through, the, through their offering. And so you, as you walk out, there's containers at each door. You can drop your offering in there as you go or the card in there as you go. We appreciate those of you who give to support our mission here at this church.